Um, and there, there are quite a few networks that have used these kinds of approaches, including the network that I work for, ALNAP, which is a network of all of the major international humanitarian agencies, or many of them. Um, at ADRRM, we've used it with ICFA, the global network itself. We, it's one, of, one of interesting tool in that it's actually been taken up by some private sector organisations. Shell have been using this kind of approach to look at their own internal communities of practice. Um, and the reason why I think this kind of approach has proved so valuable is because it can be used to gain shared strategic clarity. And in a dynamically changing world, there is, I don't think, any greater thing that you can have in a network or an organisation as shared strategic clarity. And I just want to give you an example. We'll go into these in a little bit more detail in the afternoon session, but an example of the kinds of functions and this is based on the Global Network's own work, and I think there's a handout which Marcus waved, I don't know if you've got it, Marcus waved earlier on, yeah. which structure both the activities that you've already done and maybe a wish list of the things that you could do in the future according to these categories. And there are functions like policy advocacy, knowledge generation and management, participation and partnerships, capacity building, public accountability, collaboration and coordination. And this might seem, okay, this, is, this in itself it may not be particularly radical, and I don't think it is, but actually laying all of these things out and saying this is the range of things that we can do as a network is really important. But it's also important to highlight that networks work in different ways to traditional organisations. Very seldom do you have any kind of character stick to make people work in a network. It, they're brought together by coalitions of the willing. And so the kind of techniques and models that you use for managing networks are not the same ones that you would use in a hierarchy or, a, or in a market. You are talking about facilitating networks. And again, in our research, we identified a number of good principles of network management. And there are 10 in particular that really st stood out. The first and the most important one was strategic, politically aware thinking about the key issues that face the network. Why does the network exist? And what are the power dynamics that it needs to engage with? And John went into that in far more greater, far greater detail, and far more evidence than I could do. But that was actually a really important aspect of successful networks, that they, were, they didn't avoid the political issue. And it wasn't wrapped up in this idea, um, a slightly tree huggy idea, if you like, that a network, just by coming together, can change the world, that they needed to engage with politics. The second point was around catalyzing leadership. And the important thing about catalyzing leadership is you need to have people that can really talk to, again, this really echoes what John said, talk to the different levels of a network, from the local to the global. The, the local leader is really important. And someone that can inspire at different levels is really important. Uh, innovative dialogue and the sharing of lessons and information is perhaps one of the most obvious ones, uh, obvious things that networks do. But networks that do it well invest time and money in this. This doesn't happen automatically. And a lot of people think you build your website and then you have a network. And that leads to more information graveyards than you can possibly imagine. Actually, you need to invest time. You need to invest time in making sure that you've all got a shared approach and shared mental models. Networks also work because they're informal and they're inclusive. Most of the time, you know, there are boundaries the network might be clear, but within that, anyone can talk to anyone else. There's, a, there's an egalitarianism that you might have in this room, which you wouldn't have if you were sitting, say, with all of your colleagues from your day job. Um, and that informality can really con uh, complement official structures, and I think that's a really important aspect. And uh, people that are successful in networks, and Marcus said that he himself was new to network management, but he had certain skills, the informal aspects, and you all know what I'm talking about, but Marx's interpersonal skills are a really important part of making this network work. And that's a really important thing, generally, I think, in networks, um, to be able to have people that can make and build those kinds of relationships and broker relationships. Um, there's strength in multiple levels, as we've already talked about within the network, and also in high numbers. Legitimacy, it does uh, come with numbers. But it doesn't, it's not just about the numbers, it's about representativeness. And increasingly, given the diversity that we're talking about, it's about non-traditional membership. So we in ALNAP have had our first private sector organisation apply to become a member. Should we be bringing them in? We've generally been made up of governments, 
UN agencies, NGOs, the Red Cross, research institutes that are non not for profit. Um, should we be letting a private sector organisation in? It's, it's a bit of a question. Um, arguably, you should be embracing non traditional membership because they're bringing new ideas to the table. And th it's through those non traditional members uh, that you can actually start to challenge your own ways of thinking about things. Number seven is a particularly important thing networks raise resources, they have explicit fundraising strategies or activities, they have people that are connected into donors. And they are able to show how the network is able to make more out of the resources that are given to it than otherwise might be made. So many networks operate on a real minimal budget mm. compared to an equivalent team, say, in an organisation. And part of the way that they do that is they use the multiplying effect of the social network itself to make the most of every pound that goes in. This echoes the point about informal relations that networks work when they complement rather than work against official structures. And I think it really highlights what, um, again, uh, many touch points here with what John was saying. Um, the, the example of how civil society networks really had to work hand in hand with states to make change happen. But there, there's also a, a point around networks that really dynamically adapt. They're willing to be sensitive to the outside world, draw in the knowledge of their members and say, this is what we should be doing, and constantly change question the raison d'etre of the network. And I know, for example, yesterday there, were, there was a discussion about views from the front line, and there was one dissenting voice saying, should we be doing views from the front line? And that kind of question, you know, are, is this the relevant thing for us to be doing, is really important. But combined with that, you need to have a persistence. Some change takes years and years and years to happen. Uh, the Jubilee uh, 2000 Drop the Debt campaign is an example of something that took a long time to happen. Um, and then finally kind of reached a tipping point in the late 1990s. Um, so persistence is really important. And number 10, and there's a reason why I put this down the bottom, good use of ICTs, because all too often people think networks can be driven by technology. In fact, networks should be supported by technology. Um, and a current technology, uh, a shared technology that's common to all the network members is much more important than the latest super duper technology. So this, these are some of the good principles of network management that we've identified. What I want to do now is just basically throw it open to see if there are any questions or comments on any of this. Or, um, yeah. Um, I'll take two or three at a time. So, And if you can keep them quite short and succinct, that'd be great. I've been involved in creating, facilitating creation of networks under very difficult political circumstances. But one of the lessons we learned contradicts what you said. I think uh, the lesson was uh, the smaller the size, the more efficient it is. So even if it's a huge network, you better break it into smaller clusters. With your wider experience, would you comment on that? Um. Yeah, maybe I can take two or three. I'll, I'll, that'd be good. Uh, any other comments or questions? Um, you raised the point on number eight that networks should complement official structures. Official, are you talking about government or you? Know, I would want you to explain. Because if, if in our thinking, official means government, and it means we could compromise some of the, in fact, the integrity of what civil society should do 